Uh, uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the 11th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Our first, first item on the agenda this morning is to decide whether to take item 3, consideration of our annual report in private. Are members agreed? Members are agreed. Thank you. Our next item is to take evidence on trade negotiations from Ivan McKee, the Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, and Stephen Sadler, who is the head of the trade strategy in the Scottish Government. I think it's the first time that Ivan McKee, the Minister for Investment and Innovation, has been before the Finance and Constitution Committee Minister. So, welcome. Uh, and uh, I wonder, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, indeed. Just a few words, convener. Um, so I'm pleased to be here this morning to discuss developments since the committee published its report on the Trade Bill Legislative Consent Memorandum and the Scottish Government responded last November. The Trade Bill was originally described by the UK Government as legislation which would build a future UK trade policy after Brexit although the bill that was introduced in November 2017 was more limited in scope and fell some way short of that ambition. Despite some changes that have been made to the bill since then, the committee will be aware of the concerns that we still have with the bill and the constraints that it puts on the powers of Scottish ministers in devolved areas. Mike Russell wrote to the committee on 11th March to confirm that in the absence of any movement by the UK Government to address the Scottish Government's concerns in relation to the Trade Bill. The Scottish Government cannot seek formal legislative consent for the Bill. More generally, the Bill does not provide for sufficient scrutiny of trade arrangements by either the Scottish or UK Parliaments, nor does it establish the role of devolved administrations in the development of future UK trade arrangements. The paper published by the Committee ahead of this morning's session sets out the various strands of activity that are underway in this area. I will not rehearse this, but uh, suffice to say that your committee's consideration of the role of devolved administrations in the development of future trade arrangements is well-timed. I spoke to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee last week, and I said that one thing was clear. If the UK is to create an independent trade policy, there is a huge amount to do. It is essential that the devolved administrations and legislators should play a full part in this work and the voice of Scotland's commercial and trade interests must be heard. The Scottish Government is serious about enhancing and securing Scotland's role in future trade arrangements, not just for its own sake, but because we know the importance of trade to the success of our economy. We published a discussion paper last year which makes the case for a guaranteed role for the Scottish Government and Parliament in all stages of the formulation, negotiation, agreement and implementation of future trade and arrangements. We continue to press this case in discussions with the UK Government and colleagues from Wales and Northern Ireland to ensure the economic and social needs of all parts of the UK are protected and promoted. For its part, the UK Government has made some suggestions about how this can be achieved, and you won't be surprised to hear that we do not think these go far enough yet, but we are still talking. At the same time, we are working across government and beyond to identify what matters to the Scottish economy, and in particular the key differences between Scotland and the UK, which must be taken into account in developing and negotiating trade deals that work to the benefit of the whole UK. The scope of modern trade deals is increasing, and they now typically deal with and merge a range of reserved and devolved policy areas. This is why it's so important that devolved administrations and legislators should play a full part in developing them. Convener, I know that you have written to all parliamentary committees to seek views on this, and that exercise will be invaluable. We have made it clear that there must be a role for this Parliament, as well as the Scottish Government, and I look forward to discussing what this might mean in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I I'm interested in the area of state aid. Uh, this is a policy area which is described in our committee paper may impact on future trade deals. I therefore wonder, would the Minister agree that the state aid rules could have a significant impact on the ability of any Scottish Government to deliver across many areas of devolved competence, including regional investment, agriculture and fisheries. And I, would, I wonder, in that context, what discussions is the, the Scottish Government have had with the UK Government on this matter? How would you describe these discussions? And where are the areas of agreement and disagreement? I think there's probably two parts to that. The first is round about the... Um the definition of whether the state aid is reserved or devolved, and there is a disagreement on that, which comes down to how you read 
the way the um, the, the exemptions in the, 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 the Scotland Act are, are written and what they cover and what they don't cover. So our interpretation of that is that state aid is not reserved and consequently is, is devolved. Um, and that uh, discussion back and forward between ourselves and the UK government um, is ongoing. On the practical aspects of it, you're right that state, state aid and how it's applied um, it can make a difference in terms of the impact on, as you, as you say, certain sectors or, 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 or uh, certain policies within within Scotland. But it's also true to say that the uh, the UK government has, correct, given um, a view that uh, state aid regime would not would not change at least in the in, in, the, in the short term. Um, and clearly that is something we are we're comfortable with in terms of the practicality of it but as i say the the debate about whether it's reserved or devolved is, is ongoing um and of course when you look at trade deals then whoever you're doing a trade deal with be that the eu or further afield clearly level playing field requirements will play some part in that because um, the, uh, for somebody to do a trade deal with you and for you to have scope to support your businesses um, uh, the, to the exclusion of theirs is something that would, would figure largely in those. So I think the reality of it, state aid, is, is in, in most cases one of these things that although if we were outside the EU wouldn't um, technically apply as it does at the moment, the reality is that in trade deals it would most likely be a very, the same or very similar set of, set of rules. Okay. I, I heard a bit about the, where there's a, currently a discussion going on, no agreement yet being reached, but could you tell us a bit more about where the areas of agreement are uh, in terms of uh, the principle of state aids uh, should the, the UK leave Brexit and how these discussions are going? Well, as I said, in terms of the, the, the principle of it, the, the disagreement is round about whether it's um, devolved or reserved, and that manifests itself in terms of how um, the... Uh, um, consent would would would, uh, would be asked for or, or given um, in anything regarding any any changes or proposed changes or anything that impact on state aid. But in terms of the the practicality of it, given that the UK government's position is understand it is that they they're, they're effectively going to carry on with the regime as it is at the moment uh, under EU rules. Then in practical terms. There's, 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 there's no point of disagreement because they're not changing anything and everything will carry on as it is. Um, and, and as I say, in reality, when you go beyond that to negotiate deals, then because the requirement from the other side would be that you would want to keep a level playing field in place, then um, it's uh, depending on how things unfold. But at the moment, it doesn't. There's nothing on the horizon that would suggest that that would significantly change. I don't know if there's anything you want to want to add to that. Uh, no, just to say that, that, that <coughs> it's it's more around what could happen in the future and potential changes for that, and the importance of giving the Scottish government, the Scottish Parliament, a role in those changes. So the, the, the issue of competency aside, mm. there's reason, there's areas of agreement about where. The, the, the two government have I've got have I've captured that right. The, yeah, well, the, the, the agreement is that nothing's going to change. Right. Okay. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. Now, if, if, but, but, but that, having said that, if the UK government then goes to a place where it does want to change things, then that's where this kicks in, and it becomes an issue around about whether it's devolved or reserved. Well, and at that point, it could be an issue depending on what trade deals they want to do with who, and what the requirement of those other countries would be around about state aid and what the UK government may or may not want to do. And at that point, it could become an issue. So I think that's why it's important that the the foundation is there that clarifies whether it's reserved or devolved. Okay, so that's that's the area I wanted to go into next because it's, there is potential in all these situations for consensus to break down. If that consensus does break break down, um, how will issues such as disagreements over competence or other such matters be resolved? What's the mechanism? Um, well, I, I think there's, uh, again, and we're going to talk about the wider context later on where, where it is clear what's reserved and devolved and the debate is what, what is the process for for discussion round about devolved areas, but state is particularly, and it's different because there isn't yet agreement as to whether it's reserved or devolved, so we're kind of one step back from that, which is something specific round about, about state aid um, itself. Um, so, in terms of if we got to a point 
post-Brexit, um, where the UK government wants to do trade deals and wants to change state aid rules that are applied within the UK to some extent, then at that point, this discussion about is it reserved or devolved would come to the fore, how that would be resolved uh, it's not clear, um, and what the UK government may want to do in terms of changing um, state aid provisions cle clearly isn't clear either at the moment because they haven't that that isn't isn't on the table. Um, so I think there's say, there's a general discussion round about the involvement of devolved administrations and legislators in the process of putting trade deals together, but there's a specific issue around about state aid because we can't even agree if it's reserved or devolved. And this is a comment I'm not expecting you to, to say anything, Minister. It just strikes me in a number of areas in a, which I'm watching across the Parliament as well as what we're dealing with. There's the potential for dispute in a, quite a significant number of areas, um, and it's all being dealt in with a ad, ad hoc basis. And I just wonder whether or not at some stage there's going to have to be an overview of what, where this is going on across governments from both, from, from both perspectives, where all the disputes exist and how we're going to get to a sensible resolution to all of this in terms of a process that we can find agreement. Um, yeah, I think that it just talks to the, the situation we're in where we don't know if there's going to be Brexit or not, we don't know if there's going to be a customs union or not, we don't know if there's going to be a rollover, we don't know if there's going to be trade deals. So there's hypothetical upon hypothetical upon hypothetical before we even get to the point where we start to talk about the mechanisms for resolving these. So it's um, extremely unclear and probably becoming less clear by the day. Sure. Sure. Uh, thanks very much. I'm still just a little bit unclear about the Scottish Government's policy preference uh, on, on state aid. Um, you know, there, there are those who would argue that state aid is a restriction on the ability of public policy to meet public objectives, uh, and that the absence of state aid restrictions uh, would be one of the very few upsides of being taken out of the European Union. So are you saying that the Scottish Government's position is to reluctantly accept that the state aid regime will be what the UK Government has in mind? Or are you saying that the Scottish Government's policy preference is the same as the UK Government's preference in terms of what state aid regime should apply? The reality of trade negotiations. So we can negotiate, we in the broadest sense of us doing the negotiation, can negotiate with a, another country a, a provision whereby we can do what we like to support our businesses but they can't unfairly support their businesses, you of course would sign up for that, um, as anybody would, but that's not the reality. The reality is it comes down to the trade negotiations, which is going to be um, that uh, whoever you're negotiating with uh, will, 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 in all likelihood, expect f uh, level playing field provisions but, to be in, in place. But in such negotiations, the Scottish Government's preference is for a more restrictive state aid regime, a less restrictive one, or something broadly as it stands at the moment? What do you want? Well, well I, I say if it's asymmetrical, clearly we would want something that was less restrictive for us and more restrictive for them. Of course we would, and that would be part of any negotiation. If it's going to be symmetrical, then I think the starting point is where we are at the moment because that's what the EU has got in place um, I, I, and that is what with many of the, the third-party trade deals will be in place and shifting the dial on that um, would require negotiation with the EU in the broader context in terms of when trade deal with the EU. Yeah. So it doesn't become... Yes, I mean, clearly the starting point yeah. is where we're at at the moment, yeah. but where do you want to get to? Well, as I said, I think that, to be fair, that would come down to the negotiation because it's, it's give and take. Um, and, and if, if you're... And all these things, it's, it's like saying, do you you're going to have a negotiation in the negotiation there will be offensive and defensive positions that you would take on specific aspects that you, you may then want to uh, to negotiate away and, and, and it'll, it'll vary across different sectors depending on whether we're in a position to export something to somewhere else and therefore we want something that's less restrictive or we're defensive in terms of we've got uh, sectors that we want to protect and therefore we'd want to protect other <laughs> so, so I think it comes down to the detail of the specific is that okay I was just going to say, that, I mean, the very, ge it's very general and simplistic view is that we would, we would want to remain as closely aligned with the European state aid regime as it currently is. Okay, let's move on. Adam? Yes, um, I, I, thank you, Gavin. As you said, Minister, this, this, this conversation has been hypothetical piled upon hypothetical. So I wonder if I could bring us back from the future into the, into the present. Um, and um, I, I like that reaction. Um, uh, let, let's see if we can sustain it. Um, um, uh, and, and just focus on uh, what I understand to be the Scottish Government's continuing objections to the Trade Bill. 
um, uh, as set, uh, set out helpfully uh, in your opening remarks. Given that this bill has been very substantially amended in the House of Lords since this committee reported on it, and indeed since the Scottish Government published its legislative consent memorandum in relation to the bill, and given that these amendments have very significantly enhanced uh, both parliamentary scrutiny of trade policy and of future trade deals, and have formalised a role for the devolved administrations on the face of the bill, why are SNP ministers continuing to resist this legislation? Uh, uh, well, the position is we're only at half time in this particular event, if you like. The, the, the UK government has proposed the bill. The bill went to the Lords. The Lords passed some amendments, which the UK government objected to, and the bill is now going back to the Commons, where in all likelihood we expect the UK government to take those uh, amendments that were made in the Lords out of the bill to put us back to, 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 to square one. So at the moment there isn't clarity on where we are um, and as I say depending on where this ends up um, it's in all likelihood the, as I say the Commons will take those amendments that the Lords have passed back out of the bill and we're back where we started in terms of our, our objections to it. So our objections effectively are to the UK Government's position. Um, now, if the UK Government accept those amendments, then we're, we're in a different place um, and uh, we'll see how that plays out, but that is not where we are or where we expect it but to is, be. Isn't it the case, Minister, that the UK Government has accepted the thrust of, of those amendments? And its command paper published in, in February of this year on the process for future trade agreements, for example, on page 8, there are no paragraph numbers in this document, mm -hmm. but on page 8, um, uh, the UK government says, and I quote, that international treaties are a reserved matter, which is true, of course, but that the devol devolved governments have a strong and legitimate interest where they intersect with areas of devolved competence. Is that not a, a recognition that you would want to welcome, that notwithstanding the fact that international trade and international treaties are formally reserved under the Scotland Act, that their impact is likely to be significant on devolved competence and that therefore there needs to be a formal role as provided for in the bill, both in uh, Clause 7 and in Schedule 1, for devolved administrations. Why, 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 given that UK ministers have listened to objections to the bill and have uh, accepted in the House of Lords amendments uh, to the bill, why are the SNP ministers not welcoming that and trying to work with that rather than just continuing to resist it. Just before you go there, sure. Mr. Adam, just for the sake of clarity, just so other members understand the document, can you just reference the document here? Yeah, I did. It's, a, it's page eight of the uh, UK government's command paper on processes for making pay, uh, free trade one. agreements yeah. after the UK has left the European Union, published in February 2019, it. which okay. it seems to me is a document that contradicts what the minister has just said about the UK government's intentions. Yeah, I think there's... there's, there's um, there's two parts to that. There's where we're going to end up with the bill. And as I say, we fully expect amendments that are putting in the Lords to be taken out again. But we'll see where that goes. And then we can reflect back on where it ends up. But the statements of intent by the UK government, um, in our sense, they recognise that there's an issue. But to, in our view, they don't go far enough in terms of providing a process for, for resolution of those. Why don't, why don't, can, you be, can you be specific about that, please? Why don't they go far enough and what more do they need to say in addition to what's already said in um, Clause 7.5 and Schedule 1.1? One, one? What we are looking for is what's in the discussion paper here, which is the devolved administrations I, and legislation. Minister, the same for you. Can reference you the document. This is uh, Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements, our paper published in August 2018, which lays out that the devolved administrations um, along with the legislators should have engagement in that process right from the start, which is beginning with which countries we should be talking to about trade negotiations, how we prioritise those, what the negotiating mandate is, offensive and defensive positions, through the negotiation process and through the ratification. So a process that uh, involves um, the devolved administrations in the, all aspects of those trade deals is what we've set out in the paper. Yeah. And that I, is our I, view I, as to Mr. how Mr. I, I, I understand that. I've, yeah. I've, read, I've read the yeah. paper and we've talked about it in yeah. the past, uh, both in this committee and in the chamber. Um, what I'm asking you to do for the benefit of the committee today is to specify exactly where in the UK government's command paper of February 19 and in the bill as amended in the House of Lords, as it is at the moment, I'm not interested in you know future speculative issues about what may or may not happen to this bill in the future, but we're looking at the bill as it is today, as the bill is at the moment, where does the command paper and where does the bill not go far enough in satisfying your uh, demands that, as you've just put it, devolved administrations are involved, formally involved, 
uh, in um, uh, setting trade policy and negotiating trade deals and scrutinizing trade deals and in passing trade deals, because that is all provided for on the face of the bill as it exists today and uh, in on page eight of the UK government's command paper. And I just, if, if it doesn't go far enough, I, I need to know how specifically it doesn't go far enough and what specifically you want in addition to what's already there. Right, I'll let Stephen take the detail on that. That's well, a political question. So it's a, it's a, well, it's, a Scottish, it's a Scottish government's position, and, and I've said to you the, um, there are nice words there about a recognition that there should be some involvement, but the devil is in a detail of the mechanics of how that would operate and the experience that ourselves and officials have had engagement with the UK government where we, we are very often in a position where they will say, yes, we need to involve you more, yes, we need to talk about things, yes, we need to have a concord that, yes, we need to uh, to, to, to move forward on a, uh, and engage you in these processes. And then the reality is that you get told at the last minute or not at all that something's happening um, and it's largely a box ticking exercise. That's the reality of the engagement that we've experienced and that's why it's important that what's in there has to uh, recognise that there is a, a more formal role. And I think the, the devil is in the detail and the mechanics of that, that, that's clearly our position, the mechanics of that uh, in terms of what uh, you would change um, to make that happen, I think, is, is important to nail down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the Minister referenced you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think w one of the things we would say is that actually the amendments that were made in the House of Lords were designed specifically to pick up what some members of the House of Lords saw as deficiencies in the UK government's proposals, and particularly, for example, during the scoping and negotiation phases. And I think also the, the bill, as amended still, um, gives gives uh, a role to the devolved administrations, but it not does. perhaps one as far as we would like to, to go to. The other point, to go back to your first question, I think, is why do we still have a, an opposition to the bill? I think we have an opposition to the bill because there are certain clauses in the bill that are still the same, where they uh, seek to constrain the use of Scottish ministers' powers in devolved areas. And that's a kind of Brexit-wide um, difficulty, I think, if you like, and not specifically on the trade bill. And that's a position, as you say, we have discussed in this committee, you've discussed with colleagues of ours in, in this committee and in the chamber, and it's a general government d d uh, view of that sort of those restrictions on Scottish ministers' powers to legislate in devolved areas. Yeah, and I think it's also worth referencing the, 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 the TRA, the Trade Remedies Authority, mm. where um, the UK government has resisted having any role for the devolved administrations in that process as well, which is something that we would uh, yeah. we would think should right. be uh, should be necessary in order to protect Scottish interests as we go through that. Well, I, 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 I remain distinctly unenlightened about what it is that you're objecting to in uh, uh, Clause 7.5 of this bill, in Schedule 1.1 1, 1 of this bill, or in page 8 of the Department of International Trade's um, paper published in, in February, because in all three of those instances, two on the face of the bill itself and one in a government command paper, the UK government is providing exactly what it is that the SNP ministers demanded, that's to say a formal role for the devolved administrations in the making and setting of trade policy and in the scrutiny of trade deals. You're telling me that it doesn't go far enough, but you're failing to tell me how it doesn't go far enough or why it doesn't go far enough or what specific amendments you need to see uh, to clause 75 or to schedule 1 1 to um, obtain your recommendation that this parliament gives its consent. As I say, I think there's two issues. There's, there's a constraint of powers that's been referenced, um, which is, is a wider issue around about uh, Brexit it's a, it's policy. A, it's a different and issue. The, it's a and different there's issue. the Trade Remedies Authority issue, which I've referenced as well. Angel, you're a supplementary. Yeah, uh, thanks, convener. I mean, not, notwithstanding that uh, the bill still to go back to the Commons, and none of us know, um, you know, what, what the outcome of the bill going back to the Commons will be. Um, I've been looking at the role of the UK Parliament, because it's the UK Parliament that has, um, you know, some role in approving uh, trade agreements. And there's uh, an obligation on the Secretary of State on two occasions to consult with devolved administrations, you know, one around the content of the draft uh, negotiation uh, mandate, and then before the text of the proposed agreement is actually approved. And then the UK committee, whatever committee that, that would be, has to take into account the views and circumstances of devolved administration. So given that, you know, at the end of the day, they don't need our consent, um, we've no veto, 
Um, it's been touched upon earlier that ministerial uh, powers and rule has been constrained, you know, by both the, the read over between the uh, trade bill and the EU withdrawal bill. I would be interested to know uh, what assurances the minister has had that consultation will actually be meaningful, because there's consultation and then there's consultation. <laughs> Well, as I say, we can only go on um, on the experience of what we, we, we've seen, and um, that has been um, a, a difficult process that's involved us very often um, not being informed about things, not being consulted, and, and, and only told about what's happening late in the process, um, rather than brought in earlier. And it's almost as if it's um, it's an afterthought and a bit of a box ticking exercise. Um, rather than taking on board the specifics of what the, uh, the Scottish government's uh, re requirements and the Scottish economy's requirements are at an early early stage in the uh, in the process, I think it's fair to say we've not had any response back on. Yeah, yeah. take for example the, the 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 response that we put in around about the four free trade uh, deals that the UK government has identified as being their, their first priorities, um, fairly substantial piece of uh, work on that. We've not had any any response back uh, on that. Um, and if you take another example that we might come to talk to in terms of the rollover deals, there's different priorities there for Scottish business um, round about some sectors, access to North African markets and seed potatoes, and there are others um, which we uh, feel should be priorities but haven't been prioritised by the UK government in the, the rollover deals. So there are examples of that and, and this goes into quite a bit of detail about the differences between Scottish interests in terms of offensive and defensive sectors for those four um, trade deals that the UK is negotiating at the moment, which is US, Australia, New Zealand and the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the differences an approach that would be required there. So in all of those, and in a range of contacts at ministerial and at official level, the uh, the engagement has, uh, while they've said they want to do more, has been uh, lacking in substance and often quite far down the process before we're, before we're talked to. Okay. And so, uh, given that, you know, um, it was one of the Westminster's own committees, the, the Public Audit and Constitution Affairs Committee, that raised some concerns that, you know, 20 years into devolution, there was still that uh, lack of understanding uh, or, or indeed uh, appreciation of the devolved uh, settlement. And also given that past behaviour is the best predictor of future behaviour, um, have you seen anything that gives you any confidence that in terms of any consultation process that there will be a willingness to compromise uh, and to negotiate um, over the detail. Have you had any examples of where um, your, your counterparts have uh, came and went a bit with you? And other than uh, the Trade Remedy Authority you've already mentioned, what else could be put in place in terms of process that would actually help? The indications, uh, as I say, you often will get a recognition, and I think it's fair to say Barnes Fairhead made comments on that as well, that they, they could do better. And certainly George Hollenberry has, um, ha, ha, has uh, when we've talked about this, said, yeah, we need to do better, and we recognise it's not been as good. Um, and then you might get official contact that kind of steps up its game for a short period of time and then reverts back to where it was. So I think there's something in the system there because there's not capacity, which is something we might talk about, or because there's, there's such a, a focus on the uncertainty of what's going on and trying to just deal with the, the things that are hitting them uh, um, in the wider environment round about where we go with all of this. Um, and the instinct is always for them to deal with what they've got um, uh, on a on a day to day basis, in terms of almost crisis management, without kind of reflecting back and bringing us into that process until often it's too late. So I think in, uh, among some individuals there will be an understanding that that's a requirement, but in terms of the reality of how that's embedded and how it works on a day to day ongoing mechanism, it's it's hard to see that there's a, that there's anything substantially okay. changed. I mean, so it's about culture as well as process. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I mean the, the other examples of concord that where this is this is supposed to lay all these out, uh, all these requirements out, and uh, something we can all work together on. And the, the process there has kind of been faltering. It's now now been stalled for a period of time, and, and is not making any any progress. So that's supposed to be the document that outlines how we do this work together. And even the process of pulling that document together is kind of stalled 
which kind of gives an indication of where we're okay. at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Just, just on this, this, in the same area, um, in relation to, to, to Clause 7, the, the new Clause 7 that's been inserted in the Bill does put uh, significant obligations on, on the Secretary of State to consult with devolved administrations before a draft negotiating mandate is laid and then before the text of any proposed agreement is, uh, is laid uh, as well, uh, uh, Minister. Uh, I, I hear what you had to say about the fact that this is only in the House of Lords and it may be amended in the House of Commons, which is a fair point to make, but the advice the committee got uh, earlier from our advisor was that the UK government seems to have accepted the position as set out in, in, in Clause 7 as it stands. So what I really want to understand is if, if the bill ends up with Clause 7 as it currently is, is that a position that the Scottish Government will accept or are you looking for more? And if you're looking for more, are you in fact seeking a right of veto over uh, trade agreements for the devolved administrations? No, I think it's fair to say that the, um, the, 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 we understand it's not a veto. And if you look at what we've, again, referring back to our um, Scotland's role in the development the future, UK trade arrangements paper, we identify international examples that work well where um, devolved or subnational um, jurisdictions are brought into that process at a very early stage and work right through that process, including being present in the room where the negotiations are taking place and so on and so forth. So there are specific international examples here you can refer to where it's not a veto, but there's a very strong engagement right through the process. Um, I think in terms of what you're, you're, you're talking about, we'll, we'll see how that amendment goes, our indication or our understanding it is different and that the UK government will, in, in, uh, will look to, to withdraw those amendments. Um, but um, as the other points were referred earlier round about the constraint of powers in terms of devolved uh, Scottish ministers and devolved areas and the Trade Remedies Authority are concerns that we have um, on an ongoing basis, notwithstanding anything else that may or may not be changed in the bill. Okay, I mean, that's, that's very helpful. And thank you for clarifying you're not seeking a veto. Um, but um, if that's the case, and uh, you know, given that, you know, there are quite serious obligations put on the Secretary of State in Clause 7 as it currently stands, would the Scottish Government be seeking further amendments to Clause 7? And if so, what would they be? Well, our position is we'll wait and see how that goes, goes when it comes through the Commons and where it ends up. Um, but the, uh, as I say, there are other concerns with the... the, the, the the trade bill in the wider context of the uh, EU withdrawal bill, which is problematic because of the constraints of power, and that also applies to the trade bill and the TRA, which is obviously a concern as well that we've raised repeatedly. So you, so you can't tell me today whether you're happy with Clause 7 as it stands? Well, there are other concerns on the trade bill, so the trade bill in general, we've got no, concerns about. Clause 7. Are you happy with Clause 7? I don't have Clause 7 at hand, but I mean, our requirement is that the... Um, we're involved, as we've said, right from the start in terms of deciding who we're going to be negotiating trade deals with right through the process of the negotiating mandate, through the process of the negotiations, through the ratification and, uh, and subsequently to that could, um, through could the implementation. Help, perhaps? Okay. Can I just, just add something? I think as, as you, the point you made about what, how effective consultation is, is a very important one. I think it's something from a, a practical evidence of the last year, 18 months, we would have concerns about, unless there was more spe uh, specification about how and when that consultation would take place, we would be concerned that just something that said we would consult um, devolved administrations went sufficiently far enough. I think we've mentioned the uh, UK government's document published, sorry, I haven't got it in front of me, but the one uh, Professor Tompkins mentioned in February. We're talking there about establishing a ministerial forum um, a senior officials group policy round tables. The ministerial forum hasn't been established yet, so we can talk about how effective we think on a level, on a working level, the round tables are. And as the uh, minister mentioned, we, we've had discussions around the Concordat for several months around the turn of the year based on our document and the UK government's proposals. And I think they have stalled now and we've not heard anything from them since February. So I think in that kind of context, there's a degree of sort of concern around how this would work out in practice. Moment, but I'm a bit frustrated because uh, this is just a wee bit cloudy here. I just want to make yes. sure, can I just cut through some of this and make sure that I understand what the Scottish Government is saying? Yes, there are more promises on oh. consultation. There are more promises on engagement. There's new forums, there's senior policy groups. They are all um, it, and, and, um, being suggested in the command paper and we've got clause 7 
but at the end of the day is the fundamental issue for the Scottish Government. That might all be progress, it might be slow progress, it's all progress, but at the end of the day there is no movement with, from the UK Government on mechanisms to seek agreement and for consent to be found. Is this, is, can I, if that, if that is the, where you are, can you just make sure we get that on the record? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, that's a very fair, uh, fair summation, convener. There's, um, as I say, there's, there's words there um, in terms of intent, but the reality is that what we haven't seen is that carry through in the day-to-day -day interaction, um, a willingness to engage and consult through the process as it stands just now. Um, and as you say, it's, it's not clear yet where that amendment's going to end up when it goes through the, the further stages of the process. And as I've said also, the issues around about the constraint of powers on Scottish ministers into all areas and the issue around about the TRA, the Trade Remedies Authority, mean that we are not in a position where we would uh, give consent to the uh, to the Trade Bill. OK, now, uh, Patrick was going to come in a bit later, but given we're now in the area of consent, I'm going to bring Patrick in at this stage. Thank you, Claire. I just wanted to, to follow up very briefly on, on the points you were raising there, because, uh, yes, the, the language around consultation from the UK government, that is, is vague and ill-defined, but I'm quite disturbed at how vague and ill-defined the Scottish government's position is on some of this. What we should be seeking to achieve, surely, is democratic accountability for decisions which will impact on all of our lives, from the work we do to the food we eat to the air that we breathe and, and pretty much every aspect of how we live, including huge swathes of devolved responsibility can be impacted by these decisions. Given that they can, uh, th those areas of devolved responsibility, that democratic accountability needs to be here as well as at Westminster. Why then is anything less than the same parliamentary lock in the devolved settings, as, a, as Clause 7 proposes for Westminster, why is anything less than that tolerable? No, I, I, yeah, that, uh, you, the, the, um, you're absolutely right in terms of the devolved administrations, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament has their say, because those are by definition default, and that's absolutely clear. When you go through the trade negotiations, clearly there's a lot of other aspects to that, and as we recognise, um, the, uh, all parts of the UK will, will have an input to that, and that discussion will take place. And we we'll talk about frameworks and how those are going to work out in that whole context. So, of course, there will be areas where discussion needs to take place around where, as you say, you'd put common frameworks in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yes, you're still talking about input and discussions. Are you talking about votes taking place here at Holyrood and in the Welsh Assembly where trade bills... Where where trade negotiating mandates or final texts impact on devolved competencies, are you seeking a change to Clause 7 to ensure that parliamentary approval is required for those steps here as it is required at Westminster? Yes, yeah, where it's a devolved area, of course, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have a, a say in that, yeah. A say? Well, they, they have the, the, the authority to um, pass legislation, yeah. OK, uh, I'm, I'm going to come on to the, the, the question of, of um, your position on, on withholding consent. Um, there'll, be, there'll be some people who think that the UK government's um, position is, is, is fine uh, and they'll, they'll note the, the commitment to not normally acting on devolved competence without, uh, without consent. Uh, you know, I, I think that commitment has been shown to be utterly meaningless and we shouldn't take it seriously at all. Uh, I think the, the idea of, of consultation is pretty meaningless as well. Assuming that that's not the government's position to, to, to give consent, surely we need to be doing something much more proactive now than merely indicating that we might not give consent. Surely we should be indicating to the UK government and to any of its potential negotiating partners around the world that the Scottish government will use every possible legal challenge against a trade agreement that impacts on devolved matters without consent, that we would do everything possible to frustrate and undermine anything which does that, because it would be a fundamental blow against the authority of the devolved parliament and government. So, uh, uh, I mean, you said everything possible. What are, you, what are you envisaging? We should be indicating, or the Scottish government should be indicating, that it would do everything within its power, legally, 
to challenge and undermine and frustrate the operation of a trade agreement that impacts on devolved areas which has not been agreed by this Parliament? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that we've got the legal authority to, depending on what you're talking about, to, to do to do whatever it is you're, you're describing, but clearly the position is if the UK government is negotiating trade deals, there are Scottish interests there, and be those round about maintenance of standards or, 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 or whatever in devolved areas, or um, commercial interests, be the offensive or defensive, where the Scottish government would, uh, would input into those. Of course we would. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by all means, or whatever the formal words you used but was. Minister, we, we know what this process is about from the UK government's perspective. There are people in the UK government, potentially the next leaders of the UK government, who want to strip away the social and environmental protections that have been built up within the EU. They've made that clear on numerous occasions. What I'm asking for is for the Scottish government's posture to that to be explicitly hostile. Well, I think you're, 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 you're adding a whole lot of very different things there. There's issues around about offensive and defensive sexual interests on no, trade no. deals, which is which is important. No, there's issues. Well, hey, let me finish. There's issues around about things that impact or uh, may impact on devolved areas where we may or may not have a position that we can agree with the UK government, depending on what it is. And then there are other things you're talking about, which are, as you said, stripping away rights and, and protections, etc. Clearly, if that's what's on the table, then that is something that we would wholeheartedly object to and, and make that position very clear. But there's, there's a whole range of stuff there and you, you, you're jumping into the, the, the issues where there'd be direct challenge to uh, establish rights or protections or, or, or standards. And clearly in those areas, the Scottish Government and devolved areas would have a very strong view on that and would resist that. Of course we would. There are other areas where you would look at it and say um, there are things there which are... Um, are, are, are areas that we, you could look at and say that we could perhaps agree to that. It depends what it is. There's a whole range of different things in there. And I say there's other commercial aspects that which are hugely important around sexual interests, which you would take a, a different Scottish position on based on the differences in our economy and we seek to input on those. So in some areas, yes, of course, we'll seek to input uh, and understand uh, that uh, influence uh, the UK government's trade uh, negotiating position is important. And there are other areas, um, some of the ones you're alluding to, where clearly we would have a very uh, hostile uh, take on um, to uh, any uh, any measures that the UK government was trying to impose round about <coughs> stripping away standards, protections, rights, etc. Of course we would. Absolutely. You've had three and you also want to come back in and the principles and trade as well. Do you want to come back yeah. in that later? Do you mind if I allow other folk to come in? Willie, because I want to go back into some of the, the specifics of the, the legislative process. Scrutiny. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Minister, I was just interested in the wider issue about scrutiny. Consultation isn't scrutiny. Uh, I think you're right to be cautious about just exactly what's meant by the consultative side of this and the Clause 7 and all that. But this committee at previous stages, I think even when you were a member, were interested and concerned about our ability, the Parliament's ability, committee's ability, members' ability, to hold ministers, UK ministers, to account and to scrutinise any of the deals and proposals that come forward. Is it your view that we're anywhere even near that at the moment and having that ability to have that close scrutiny that I think we all shared and, and said we wanted in this committee? No, no, I think that's. Uh, the, I think we're a, we're, a, we're a long way from that. If you um, if you look at the examples I've mentioned, the four trade deals that are on the table just now, and the Scottish government's response to that, which we um, we published last November, that hasn't been. Uh, ha we haven't had any discussion with the UK government or any response on that um, on those uh, those four trade deals. That, that, that we've had meetings since then, but this has not been has not been discussed in, in, in detail. We've not had a response to that, so that's one aspect. Um, and if you say, if you talk about the mechanics of it, where we are with the Concord, that if you talk about the rollover deals as well, where um, there's been a number of those have been flagged up. Norway, for example, where it's been flagged up as a rollover has been done, but with with changes because there are parts of it that haven't been rolled over um, and the Scottish Government hasn't been engaged or involved in that, that process at all in terms of how those uh, those uh, the, the rollover of those uh, the changes to those rollover deals uh, looks like and um, an, another example was there was no involvement with us around about when the UK Government published their, uh, their no deal tariffs for, for day one after no deal um, and 
we heard about those the same as everybody else um, when they were, were published. So there's a number of areas where while there's talk about yeah, you need to be more involved, the reality of it is that that hasn't, hasn't happened. Mm. The, the minister, UK minister, say, wrote to the committee, George Hollingbury wrote to us, and they described this intention to set up this new intergovernmental ministerial forum to provide the formal mechanism for the devolved ministers to discuss and provide input, mm. but it, it doesn't really mention <laughs> scrutiny. It says it's a matter for our parliament to determine how we might scrutinise our government in this, but I think the impression that we had as members of this committee that we would be able to reach out and invite and bring to our committee UK ministers to scrutinise their proposals. I think that's what I understand by scrutiny, and I hope that you share that. No, that's, 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 that's absolutely true, um, and I think that's what you would expect and hope would happen. Um, and as I say, we've um, we, we've got a long way to go to see evidence of that. And I'd refer back to the Concordat, which is kind of stalled. It would lay out some of the 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 the, the, uh, the processes round about that, but we can't even get the process defined mm. as to what the process is. So, 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 so just lastly, is that, this that, forward. that ministerial forum that the UK minister referred to is that. Did, you, did Mr Sadler, did you say that hasn't been established yet? Is there any indication of when it might be? Or what? No, unless officials have any further no, information. No, I, I mean, that, that's part of the discussions we've had at official level to begin with on developing a concordat on international trade. And as I said before, um, the last we heard from the UK government on that was in February. And I think that the, the aim had been to develop a degree of understanding and agreement at official level before putting it to respective ministers, including Welsh ministers as well. And we haven't got, we haven't heard back from the UK government since February. So the, the rest of it that follows the ministerial forum and other things have not been able to be set up. Okay, thank you for that, Alex. Uh, thank you, convener. And yeah, still on process, and I know there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and wanting to be able to scrutinise it here at the committee. Um, I wonder, can the minister give a detailed account of the work being done by the senior officials group? Well, it's an official script, so um, the, uh, is anything happening on that? And there is interaction, <laughs> um, but uh, it's patchy. Um, and certainly when I go to meetings, it's, um, yeah, officials have been talking, and then oh, officials have stopped talking because the UK government's too busy doing something else. So it's kind of on and off. Um, the sharing of information hasn't been to the level we would hope and expect. Um, and while there has been discussion, it kind of goes through cycles of getting a wee bit better and then dropping off again and tailing off, and then nothing happens for a period of time. So it's patchy, it's not regular, um, and the, the amount of information that comes through that process is not to the standard that we would expect. But... Stephen might want I, to. I think that sums it up perfectly. Yeah. I think what, d d above all of this, <coughs> or, or restricting all of this, is the fact there's been no progress on developing a concordat. And so I think when UK, Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Ireland officials get together, there's a there's a constraint on them about how far they can go to talk about things because there's not been a kind of concordat basically on what they what the UK government is able to or willing to share with the devolved administrations. Are you on that group? Um, my boss is. I, I yeah. go along as well. <coughs> and, and have they been meeting regularly? Have you got they some uh, meet the around every six weeks, yes. And that's still been going on? Uh, they, they, yes, yeah. they, 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 they are actually uh, taking place. And the next meeting? Um, sometime in June. I don't think it's been set yet. Okay. Thank you. James, Common Frameworks. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, you'll be aware that the committee have been looking at the issue around common frame frameworks. Uh, in terms of um, future trade deals or agreements, what, what do you think are the, the main issues that need to be set up in the common frameworks to help facilitate these? Um, well, obviously, we're at very early stage in that process, as in, as in much of this, um, and there's going to have to be across a whole range of the uh, devolved areas um, a look at what needs to happen. Um, the, um, uh, I think there's a list of 24 areas where there's, uh, there's potential requirement for common frameworks. Um, and I suppose it's the process of what the frameworks cover um, is, is a discussion that needs to happen first before you actually get into the details in each one of the 24, how they're going to be run and what's going to be uh, what the mechanism is going to be, or, or, or what the details are going to be in each of these areas for uh, for discussion or agreement or disagreement around about that. But as I say, I think we're still, because everything else is going on, at a fairly early stage in terms of understanding what, what those are going to look like. Uh, one, uh, one issue that's come up in the committee evidence sessions is uh, procurement. So just in terms of procurement, uh, obviously that's a big area around trade deals and agreements, a big area that 
Scottish Government would have an interest in, uh, where the trade deals affected Scotland. What, what do you think are the main issues there? Um, yeah, you're right. There's going to be different... Um, it's a devolved area, so there's a need for the, uh, the, the, the Scottish Government and our devolved administrations to have, uh, have their views and the parliaments have their views heard on that. Um, if you go into... I mean, depending on what happens, if you end up dropping into WTO rules in a no-deal scenario, um, there's, there's still GPA rules around about that as to what... Uh, what you, you can do and what you, you can't do around about procurement. So it's constrained at many levels, regardless of what kind of trade deal you go into. But notwithstanding that, um, it's important that, because it's the devolved area, the Scottish Government's got input into that. And as I say, the mechanics of what that framework looks like is still to be, uh, to be resolved. And what do you think the Scottish Government needs to, to see in their common frameworks or those agreements to ensure that, again, given the example of procurement, that uh, the, the agreements are consistent with Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament policy? Well, I think there's two different things. There's the issue around about how you structure the framework and the mechanics of that and how that works, which is still to take place. Then there's the detail of once you've got the framework, having the discussion around about what the issues are and how you resolve those issues. Um, so I think there's two different things, and I think we're a ways away from getting into the detail on any, any specifics, but of course you could identify areas where potential, there, there will be areas of disagreement around about procurement, um, but we've got to go through the process of, of deciding on how the framework gets set up, and then going through for each of those what's, uh, what the areas of disagreement are and how they're going to get, how they're going to get resolved or not. On, on that specific one, the procurement one, in term, if I understand it correctly, the common framework around pr pr procurement is not... Con I don't think it's one that's going to be considered to be a legislative process. So I, if I've got that right, in these circumstances, there will require to be agreement between both the UK and Scottish Government on that common framework before it can progress. Is that correct? Sure. But maybe I'm wrong. Oh, oh, can I yeah, just... I mean, no. there is... Um, in, pa in parallel to the main international trade concord that there is also a procurement concord that being developed i think and you're, and you're, you're right Kavina, that that envisages a degree of consultation involvement engagement but again that is sort of put progress on that has stopped for a couple of months as well tom did you have a supplementary in that area yeah it's, it's really just picking up it picks up in james's point but also some of the points raised by murdo and adam earlier uh one of the amendments that was ultimately withdrawn with regards to the trade bill was that in the name of Lord Stevenson of Balmacara and it sought to introduce a requirement for the consent of Scottish ministers um, for use of powers under section 1.1 and section 2.1 of the trade bill. They refer to implementation of the agreement on government procurement and implementation of international trade agreements. Um, and when we uh, it was Vika and Younger on behalf of the UK government um, was responding. He committed that the UK government would um, seek to respect the sole convention, which applies to primary legislation. Um, however, it stated that it was stated that this should not be extended to secondary legislation. Now, as I understand it, and perhaps you can clarify if I've misunderstood this, the UK government has left the door open to implementing common frameworks via secondary legislation, which would there ergo not be subject to the sole convention. So has, in saying that uh, that sole convention doesn't apply, apply to subordinate legislation, that subordinate legislation could be used potentially to implement some common frameworks. Is this a, a get-out-of-so-free card that the UK government can play in the implementation of common frameworks? Or have I misunderstood the UK government's position? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a potential and that's a concern. And there are discussions ongoing at the moment to, um, to kind of deal with that and close that, uh, close that loophole, yeah. yeah. Listen, can I, the, in the, if I understand this correctly, in the UK government's paper on common frameworks, they made the explicit, um, well, maybe, maybe the word explicit is a bit strong, but they suggested that, as Tom's outla outlined, that common frameworks would be potentially brought through through 
second round of legislation in these circumstances, obviously the consent of Parliament here or indeed the government here would not be required. Um, is that something the Scottish Government is taking seriously? Um, and what, what, what are you doing about it? Well, that's something that we've um, we've raised, um, and that, yeah, it's, it's potentially problematic, um, and it's something that, uh, that there is that there is a potential for that to be used, as you say, to bypass bypass Sewell on specific uh, aspects, and that's something that we are uh, aware of and are uh, are concerned and is about. That, and is that something that Minister Mike Russell is prosecuting, or is that something in your yes, in your bag? That would be Mike Russell would be taking that forward. Okay. Emma. Thank you, Convener. Um, good, morning. good morning. I'm interested in some of this devil in the details stuff about sectoral interests and specifically food and drink, beef, sheep as well. Um, on my notes here, it says the food and drink industry is a major contributor to Scotland's economy. It is worth about 14 billion each year and accounts for one in five manufacturing jobs. I know that we've got about 660,000 workers in agriculture in Scotland. So my concern is that, uh, the, that there might be some risk or, or constraints with trade deals, particularly with the US. We've already seen that the National Cattlemen's Beef Association have already stated that US beef sales to the EU have been flat over the past few years, and we cannot continue to justify the continued application of non-science-based standards on US beef, especially in the UK once they leave the EU. I've been looking at issues around um, the US Department of Agriculture. They logged, logged 97 meat recalls for serious health hazards in 2018, ranging from 12 million pounds of raw beef that made 250 people ill from salmonella. And there was a withdrawal of 174,000 chicken wraps for possible listeria. So, this concerns me, Minister, and additionally, there's issues around antibiotic-resistant salmonella on beef products in the US. So, and, you know, as a nurse, I have real concerns about antibiotic resistance as part of my health committee role. So I'm wondering what you see as specific trade concerns if we start doing negotiations with America, Trump, bargain basement cheap Trump trade deals, is that what we're looking at in the future? Well, I would hope not. <laughs> um, and uh, you're absolutely right to raise those concerns, and there are concerns. When you talk about the agricultural sector, I suppose, you're talking about uh, the importance of the economy, which you started off by talking about, which is, as I say, when you come down to negotiate the deals, what the offensive and defensive positions you're able to take are, and what the tariff regime is going to be, and, and so on and so forth. And clearly, the, the, the start of a process there, um, depending on how those trade deals work out. In terms of food standards, which is the second part you raised, um, and that uh, something that Mr Harvey mentioned earlier, clearly we are very concerned about that. Um, it's something that we see as a potential... Um, risk of entering those uh, those trade deals with the US in particular and it's something that we've uh, raised and highlighted in our um, uh, information that we put back to the UK government round about the four trade deals we talked about that they've started looking at as I say, of, of which the US the US is one so maintaining those standards to our mind is hugely important um, and it's something that we would uh, we would argue very strongly for and part of that is the the protected geographical indication status of our beef and our lamb and our whiskey. It's £5 billion to the UK economy last year alone. So I'm, I've been battering on about PGI for like a, a while now, and I think we really need to look at how do we protect our brands, our beef and our lamb, from inferior uh, imitation pro products that might come in. And I know there's been ruminations about Scotch whiskey, changing the definition of what is Scotch whisky so that uh, maybe a three-year-old brand can be called Scotch, which is completely different to the way it's made in this country. Uh, yeah, those are all concerns, and clearly the different uh, geographical indications are depending on... Um, whisky's got its own separate set of protections, uh, Scotch whisky, in, in addition to that. Um, but round about the food stuffs, 
there are clearly the, the GIs are critically important to many producing sectors in Scotland. Um, at the moment, we've got a situation where those are protected through the processes and through the EU. And if you're going to open that up and have those trade negotiations, then of course that's something that you, there is a risk would not be protected as well as they are as well as they are just now. And I think it kind of talks to the the concept that we go out in the big wide world and negotiate all these uh, trade deals ourselves. Um, but what that does do is put a lot of these sectors, sexual interests in Scotland, uh, the, the, the geographical indications and other aspects on the table for negotiation, which is something that we would uh, you, you wouldn't want to be given away. Um, so that risk is there and we're opening ourselves up to that by the fact that we are... Uh, um, looking to uh, negotiate trade deals. The UK is independently from a position, frankly, of, of, of some weakness. Um, and it's in those negotiating stances that you end up having these kind of problems. So from the Scottish Government's point of view, clearly we're, we're, we're very aware of that. We talk about it uh, constantly. It's something that we put on the table with the UK Government to raise uh, raise the, the profile of in our opposition to any diminution of those standards and opening up or, or removal of a uh, failure to protect the GIs. Um, and, uh, but it is a risk that uh, when you end up in that environment they are potentially heading into, these things get put on the table. Do you think the UK ministers uh, are, are listening to the concerns in Scotland? Um, when George Hollenbury was here, he said that Scotch whisky was very, very, very important. So, OK, that's good for Scotch whisky, but are they listening to the concerns from National Farmers Union and um, Scottish ministers. Yeah, right. If you look at it in a broader con context of the process, there's discussions that we can have just now, and people will say this is important, that's important, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reality is, when you get into those kind of trade deals, which has been run for years um, and go through many iterations and many. Um, trading of different aspects, offensive, defensive, back and forward, which sectors are important, what tariffs do you want to put on, what standards do you want to... There's a, an awful lot that's put into the mix, and at the end of the day, as you get towards the end of those negotiations, there's uh, to get a deal done, if, if that's what you want to do, you have to give things up to get things you want. Um, so is isn't this a question of saying things are important, because everything's important, but that's not the point. The point is uh, which is the most important and which ones... Are, uh, are your red lines around about the negotiation. So we clearly would have different red lines or an intent to have different red lines um, in those negotiations to what the UK government might have. Um, and uh, if you look at what the most important sectors are, clearly food and drink is Scotland's top export sector, number one or number two. Um, and the uh, for the UK government, it doesn't figure as largely. So if they were looking at what sectors to protect um, in trade deals, they may end up in a position where food and drink isn't as highly uh, regarded and as important to, to them as it would be to us. And that's why I'm that kind of, I think, a talk's very... Um, we've had a lot of discussion round about the, the, the scrutiny and, 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 and consent and people listen to people and talk to people. But when it really gets down to the detail, that's where it impacts. It's where Scotland's got important sectors that are worth a lot to our economy that aren't worth as much in a UK context and uh, both in terms of protection through GIs, in terms of tariff regimes and in terms of standards could, uh, could get thrown under the bus as part of a tense, fraught negotiation when it reaches the final final stages. Well, the words expendable come to mind they from do. previous negotiations. Okay, thank okay. you. Right. Um, Patrick, are you still want to go into principles issues? Are you, are you exhausted that earlier? Uh, no, I, th I think it's still um, worth exploring. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in what the Scottish Government's general approach to trade policy is. You know, either in the in the longer term, if the Scottish government has more of a role, or in relation to this process, because you know we're we're living at a time when there's a rise of economic nationalism, you know, trade war being uh, being waged by a, a chaotic U.S. administration led by someone who doesn't appear to uh, understand how tariffs work. Uh, we've got uh, the Brexit process, which is a a project being run by hard right ideologues free market obsessives <coughs> and I'm, I'm a little unclear what the Scottish government's position is other than seeking to get some narrow sectoral advantage whenever it has the chance. Does the Scottish government believe that free markets 
are inherently a good thing. <laughs> well, you need to define your terms there, but uh, we believe that trade is important. We believe that the Scottish economy needs to internationalise more, um, and uh, we, we take great efforts to do that. But the devil is in the detail, and we recognise that there are... Uh, there are, there are interests that, uh, that we need to protect and opportunities we need to secure. And as I say, all of that comes down to, um, in any given trade situation, what you want to be, uh, what you want to be pushing. We think that uh, market access issues around about food and drink for Scottish product are important and we seek to identify and, uh, and, and, and do what we can to support removal of those where it makes sense. Um, and there are other areas where, uh, as we've talked about, the, the protection of Scottish sectors because of its importance to the economy or because of um, the, uh, the standards issues we've talked about are important to defend. So I, th I think to say there's a blanket, you're all in favour of this or you're all in favour of that, the world is unfortunately slightly more grey than that. Protect once and protection once. Hmm. Does yeah. the Scottish Government believe there is a legitimate role for protectionism? When it comes to standards, yes, and I think you do too. And I, I do indeed. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of unclear why there is, is no political substance, for example, in the, the Scotland's roll paper that you described earlier. Uh, it's, it's all about how important trade is, but it doesn't seem to set out a clear principled position. For example, it states uh, that the Scottish Government wants a roll, uh, quote, to help industries protect public, uh, devolve public services and ensure the highest standards of environmental and consumer protection. Do you recognise that there is a tension and sometimes a contradiction between protecting industries and protecting public services uh, and uh, environmental and, and consumer protections? I mean, the whole trade negotiation process, the clues in the name, it's a negotiation where you've got different interests that you need to balance on your side and on the part of your trading with side. And as I say, they're, they're, they're complex and take years for a reason because they aren't just blanket statements about we're 100% in favour of this or 100% against that. There are... Um, standards that we think are hugely important that we would uh, take every step to protect um, and uh, that's uh, that that's clear um, and there are areas where there will be negotiations in about differential so sector be, interests so which the, are important to in which it is not possible to both help an industry and protect a public service for example the private healthcare industry you can't well, be I think on we're the very side of the clear private healthcare industry and on the side of a public health provision well, I think we're very clear that in terms of the NHS, we wouldn't want any uh, privatisation of, of, of the health service. We've made that very clear. We've made very clear that the difference between um, the direction of the NHS south of the border is different to that in Scotland. Uh, we see it as a risk of uh, opening up um, the, the health service in Scotland, potentially as part of a trade deal to, um, to privatisation um, is something that we are completely opposed to. So I think that that is clear. Um, so I think that's clear. I think what we've said on, uh, on standards, food standards, environment standards uh, uh, and others is, uh, is clear as well. Um, and uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that, our position on that, that is clear. Um, if you take a step back from that, you would uh, you ask what is our, our position on trade policy. Our position on trade policy is we should stay in the customs union and single market because that's the best way to uh, well, yeah, deliver a trade the, policy I mean, for the Scotland. The customs union and the single market are also entities which act on a trade policy. You know, you, your trade policy seems to be that trade is good and you would like to do more of it rather than having a clear principled position. For example, we, as we were talking about when the convener was asking about state aid, you, you, you seem to be saying that in relation to state aid you, you want some, some sectoral advantages, but you didn't seem to articulate a clear stance about what is the legitimate role of the state in intervening in markets in the public interest. I think you, you, you kind of got to recognise the reality of, uh, of, of, of where we are. I think that... Um, I think I'm clear. I mean, yeah, you start from position is trade good, yes, trade is good. Yes, of course, as we want to internationalise Scotland's economy, further I've said that, the whole export plan is about how you do that. It's about identifying opportunities to increase uh, trade internationally to, uh, to, 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 to further strengthen Scotland's economy, um, to use our technological and other advantages to... Uh, 
to, uh, to to deliver products and services around the world. I think we're, we're very clear on that direction. But there are areas, of course, and that's all part of the complex uh, situation that's there. It isn't, uh, isn't a, a simple blank and white. There are areas there, and I've, I've, I'll say them again, I mean, around right about privatisation of, of the NHS or other public services, around right about food uh, food safety standards, around right about environmental standards, around right about uh, workers' rights, around right about a, a range of issues. There are areas where um, our perspective on those is that those are hugely important. Uh, they are red lines for us, and we see a difference between our view there and the view of the UK government, and yeah. consequently, the that is one of the real, uh, one of the substantive reasons, rather than uh, just talking through process, one of the substantive reasons why we think it's critically important that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have an input to those trade negotiations right through the whole process. Convener, we're clearly not going to resolve all, all of this. I, I don't understand what you're... Um, Convener, by encouraging the Minister on the next occasion that you produce a document uh -huh. like Scotland's role to include some kind of attempt at defining a clear, principled stance in relation to what trade policy should look like, rather than just how we get a bit more advantage in the short term. But that, that, the whole point of trade policy is to get a bit more advantage. That's the whole point of it. Um, yeah. Given right. what your red lines are round about the issues that I've met, talked about, and I'll mention them again, round about protection of public services from privatisation, round about food standards, other safety standards, round about environmental standards. Those, those areas you, you, you mark out as, as areas that are red lines for you. And beyond that, it's about how you build your economy um, and trade more internationally to uh, for, for the good of it. You've said enough now, Patrick. Angela. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, Minister, we've all been round the houses a few times th this morning, but um, the bottom line, you know, the heart, the heart mm. of the matter surely is that uh, the EU currently has the largest web of preferential uh, trade agreements. Uh, I think at last count, 70 spanning across five continents. Is there anything on the table that's going to match that? Uh, well, no. Um, and the reality is that, the, as you correctly identified, the EU is uh, one of the three large trading um, uh, entities in the world with the US and China. It's um, able to do deals uh, because of its scale and scope um, that uh, other uh, entities aren't able to do. And um, as you correctly identify, it's got, well, it's more than 40 trade deals plus other, other deals on top of that. And the UK government, after um, the, the best part of three years, is struggling to... Um, to transition more than a handful of those, and even those um, are um, are uh, aren't complete. And some of the countries, Canada, South Africa, and others, have said that they see no interest in talking to the UK about um, about rollover of deals because the UK has had to give away so much on the uh, No Deal Day One tariffs that uh, those countries have pretty much got what they want from that process. So see no no need to give anything away um, by rolling over the existing trade deals that they have with the EU. So yeah, you, 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 the UK is starting off from a, a much weaker position um, and. Uh, and because of time constraints, we're much further behind because as many of these deals take years to do and the Brexit process puts us in a position where we don't have the luxury of that time and when the clock's ticking on your side and not on the other side, you're in a weak position. Um, and uh, for all of those reasons, it's a, it's a weak place to be negotiating from. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I thank our witnesses for their time and contributions this morning to the discussion. At the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the next item in private and therefore now close this public part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.